Fugino, uh, her research and her teaching interests include Asian American social movements, Japanese American radicalism, Afro-Asian solidarities, race and gender uh, studies, and biography and oral history. Uh, many of you, including myself, know about her book because you're using it in your classes, you've read it. Um, her amazing book about Yuri Kochiyama, titled Yuri Kochiyama, <coughs> Heartbeat of a Struggle, The Revolutionary Life of Yuri Kochiyama. In 2009, she edited Wicked Theory, Naked Practice, which looks at the Afro-Asian influences on Fred Ho's music and le leftist politics. She's published an array of articles, scholarly, both scholarly, well, scholarly and activist um, journals, including Social Justice, Journal of Men's Studies, Afro-Asia, Teaching American Studies, and, and many, many more. Uh, at UCSB, Professor Fujino teaches courses on the Asian American movement, third world social movements, Japanese American history, Asian American gender and sexuality, Asian Americans in the black radical imagination. She even initiated uh, within uh, community studies a peer advising program in Asian American studies. And if that's not enough, she's also taught an experimental high school outreach course on Puerto Rican history and resistance. A lot of you wonder how do I combine what I do in academia with the community? Just ask. It's all here. Um, the list goes on, but in the interest of time, I would really like to turn to the book. Uh, that The book today, Samurai Among Panthers. This book talks about the life of Richard A. UC Berkeley and in the Asian American Political Alliance. We'll let Professor Fugino talk about the book, but it's worth mentioning that in recent weeks, there's been a lot of controversy surrounding allegations. Allegations made by Seth Rosenfeld that Aoki was an informant for the FBI. Uh, these documents that were released through the Freedom of Information Act have been really damning. They've shown really damning evidence suggesting that Aoki was working for the FBI. Professor Fugino, however, has courageously and meticulously countered these allegations in print media and in radio. I know a lot of you folks have heard um, the professor on radio. Just yesterday, at the Eastside Arts Alliance in Oakland, an overflow crowd of 250 to 300 people came to see Professor Fujino <coughs> speak, along with Emery Douglas, Tarika Lewis, and Bobby Seale, of course, on Richie, uh, Richard Aoki, Black Panther, and Asian American activists, Cointel, Cointel Pro attacks, and reclaiming the legacy. It really was an inspiring event in which members from African American, Asian American, and other communities re-embraced each other. Re-embraced. We thank Professor Fugino for being uh, an inspirational leader in these efforts to build solidarity amongst our different communities. And most of all, we just really thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I thank Professor Beadle for that very generous introduction and I also need to thank Professor Wes Wenthin and Jason Ferreira and Lorraine Dong and Asian American Studies, Ethnic Studies. I'm understanding eyes on Arizona I must thank too. And I also want to thank, I know that there's some veterans of the 60s and 70s and the San Francisco State strike and other strikes and just these struggles in the 60s and 70s and I need to show my appreciation because not only do I have a job that enables me, that pays me to do research and gives me small amounts of money but enough to travel and do some of this work, um, most importantly I have the time and the struggles of the 60s and 70s have really transformed the ways people think about race so that it's a much more legitimate area of study. Um, and there are other struggles that we're fighting against now, which I will talk about when I talk about this good 60s, bad 60s framing. But the, the idea of studying race is, well, we know it's contested in Arizona, but in, uh, in some places, I hope at San Francisco State, at my university, UCSB, at least in the places that matter, it's, 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 it's accepted, and we're not just defending that. So, um, and of course, this is a historic location, right, where the first school of ethnic studies was uh, fought for and won. Um, this has, wow, I'm happy that even more people are coming in, so you guys can just scoot, scoot in and... Can you hear me? Oh yeah, this is easier. Um, this has been three weeks... Yeah. If you
you can't hear me, let me know. This has been three weeks of searching for the truth as a moving target. As you know, on Friday morning, I woke up to discover that Seth Rosenfeld had uh, posted a 277-page PDF of FBI files and search slips released to him under a Freedom of Information lawsuit. It's hard to hear you in the back. It is hard? Yeah, we have the microphone. Okay. What can we do about the feedback? Okay. I had not wanted to start this talk with those charges, but shortly after those released files, it's hard to talk about Richard Aoki without that weighing heavily on people's minds. So I want to get a sense of how many of you have been following the Aoki controversy? So most people. How many of you read the FBI files or some of the FBI files that were posted Friday? Okay. And how many of you knew about Richard Aoki before this controversy? Yes, this I know shows some of the good work that the professors and students and others are doing here at SF State. Um, there seems to be three major responses to these newly posted FBI files. First, there are those who believe them unquestioningly, assuming that FBI sources are accurate. Second, there are those who deny Aoki could have been an FBI informant. And this is the stance taken by some Black Panther Party leaders, including Panther co-founder Bobby Seale. And third, the truth may lie somewhere in between and more investigation is needed. Having read through the entire files on Friday, I want to offer a possible uh, scenario for the third option. But I also add the caveat that I've not had enough time to do additional research or to re-review the documents thoroughly. And, um, and so my thoughts today are preliminary. But I raise a possible third option to show that rather than taking the FBI files at face value, they require more scrutiny. Perhaps, and the jury is still out on this, Aoki was an FBI informant in the early 60s, at a time when he was rather conventional and voted for Richard Nixon in 1960. But he may have gotten changed in the process of reading and working with the Young Socialist Alliance and the Socialist Workers' Party. He was certainly well-read in Marx and Lenin and theoretically advanced, which is not typical for an informant. Having grown up in the concentration camps and the black working class community of West Oakland, he was already experientially understood racism and poverty and social inequalities and seemed to have been open to left analyses of power and society. By the mid-1960s, if the FBI reports are accurate, Aoki seems to have wanted to have to get, to get out of this role with the FBI. A January 11, 1965 report indicates that Aoki wanted to prioritize schooling and needed to work to save money for school and thus wanted to curtail his FBI activities. There were also a couple of odd things in the report. In August of 62, there's a flurry of air tells, these you know, communications uh, that, that went to people quickly by air, mail, between the FBI director and this um, special agent in charge in the San Francisco office, instructing that the informant return immediately to San Francisco. Aoki is not named in this file um, at all. Then reports begin in May 1965, another set of kind of odd things, suggesting that the informant caused some kind of embarrassment, that the, the informant had caused some kind of embarrassment to the Bureau. And it's not clear if this might be related to the Black Panthers um, you know, going in armed to Sacramento to protest the Mulford bill that wouldn't allow them to um, have weapons in their police patrols. And um, one document dated May 1, 1967, the special agent in charge of the Sacramento office was instructed by the FBI director to personally ensure that the informant is operating in such a manner as to preclude any possible embarrassment to the Bureau. A February 29, 1968 uh, document says that with the exception of the information previously furnished to the Bureau, there's no indication that this informant will be in the future a source of embarrassment to the Bureau. But what happened? You know, what, what did the informant do that was an, an, a source of embarrassment? I mean, I think these are questions that, are, that we can raise. I mean, was this person not informing in the way they were, the FBI wanted them to? Something happened, right? 
There's a handwritten note dated December 1, 1967 that reads, immediately submit a four-month evaluation letter regarding the captioned informant. Letter was due November 1. Continued delays of this nature will result in discontinuance of the informant. So something was happening during this period. What it was, it's very hard to know because most of these um, papers are redacted, they're blanked out. Uh, I do want to say that on most of the files of these 200 plus pages, there is no name associated with the, uh, with the report, no, no name of an informant, and there's only minor information on, on most of these pages. They might say something like, the person was an undergrad at UC Berkeley, which could obviously refer to anyone. There are other pages that do have more specific um, information that seems to uh, link it to Richard Aoki, but those are a minority of the pages. And these three documents that I just referred to all have no association with Aoki. Um, I also question when exactly did Rosenfeld receive these FBI files? He writes that the FBI released them after the initial story and video were completed. This seems to imply that these were released after August 20th or at least sometime within the last month. And this just seems a bit convenient. Um, but I also ask, what does initial story refer to? Because uh, my own manuscript was submitted to the press a full two years before it was published. And if he received the materials earlier, then why weren't they in his book and this other material? I'm just raising questions and, and suggesting that there's more that needs to be asked. Um, so my point in raising these questions and possible alternative readings is to support my contention that the jury is still out on Aoki's guilt and requires more investigation and critical analysis. Um, these FBI files raise a host of questions that, um, well, that, that we need to know more about, but I do want to introduce you to the Richard Aoki that I came to know so that we might understand him in his full humanity and not as a fill in the blank. You know, yes, no, was he an informant? And I think that that's what many people want to know, but I, I would be confident that in this room we can talk beyond that and look at context and, and look at other questions that need to be raised. This banner was um, commissioned by the It's About Time Black Panther Party alumni group and it was brought in by former members of the Black Panther Party at Richard Aoki's memorial at UC Berkeley in May of 2009. And on this you can see his two most visible connections, political connections. One is with the Black Panther Party, um, of which he is the highest ranking non-black in the party, the most prominent non-black. He was one of the earliest members, a captain of the very tiny Berkeley chapter, a field marshal at large. He also was a leader of the Third World Liberation Front at UC Berkeley, which took place in winter of 69 um, and got a lot of inspiration and direction from the San Francisco State strike that occurred a couple of months before that. Um, and so that, that's recognized. The banner also contains on the beret a very barely visible political button of the Asian American Political Alliance. This organization was established in May of 68 and was one of the earliest and most influential organizations of the nascent Asian American movement. Many other APA chapters across the country, including here at San Francisco State, emerged, and the Berkeley APA chapter was the first one. And that's, this organization is credited with coining the very term Asian American. Um, as seen in this iconic image, Richard cuts a striking pose and is arguably the most iconic figure of the Asian American movement. In 2009, half a year after Richard uh, died, filmmakers Ben Wong and Mike Chang held the premiere of the documentary Aoki. And I, through a trailer of this film, I want to introduce you to him, although I recognize many people have seen the full documentary, which is wonderful. But for those who haven't, we'll spend four minutes watching this trailer. You'll get a sense of who Richard was and his um, his sense of humor and wit.